call slated design. If you need to talk and you signal me out there, um, I'll, but you can unmute yourself. I've allowed that setting. So you can unmute yourself. The introduction to us later design, as I said, we are not going to go into the design itself, but I'll share a material that has a complete design of a mobile voltage control oscillator. So the voltage control oscillator that is used in the mobile phone. I'll share with you a document that outlines the design in ADS. And those of you who may be um, willing can uh, practice on that. But here we are going to introduce just the basic aspect of uh, oscillators. Um, and then the design, you can take care of it. Those of you who will be at home and will be interested in your, your computers and you have uh, your ADS, I'll share that document and then you can start learning how to design the oscillator. So what is an oscillator circuit? The oscillator circuit basically is a circuit that generates periodic signals. When we say periodic signals, you know we're talking about um, uh, like uh, sinusoidal waves, like uh, uh, triangular waves, anything that is periodic, it has uh, a period and it keeps recurring. So those kind of uh, signals, which are usually used as carrier waves, whether in modulation, in your amplitude modulation or whatever, those ones are generated by the oscillator. In other words, you cannot have a transmitter or a receiver if it is working wirelessly without an oscillator. The oscillator is a key component of the receiver or the transmitter. In the transmitter, the oscillator provides the carrier wave, which is modulated for transmission. And in the receiver, it provides the wave or the signal that is required for the down converting of the incoming signal, which is at a high, at a high frequency. So that signal at a high frequency needs to be converted down to a lower frequency. And again, the local oscillator supplies that signal for the down conversion. So generally what you see is that the uh, setup is that you have a mixer. Okay, this is a symbol of a mixer. And then you must have the incoming signal somewhere here. Let's see, that's uh, the RF in. Forgive my uh, for this. And then there must be the local oscillator, LO. So this local oscillator will supply the signal and you have the incoming RF signal. When they mix, then they give the output what? IF signal. And you know that the mixing of the RF and the incoming signal will give a sum and difference of frequency. So <clears throat> whether omega C plus uh, omega M and then omega C minus omega M. This sum and difference of frequencies is what appears here at the IF, but you can use a filter to filter out what you want and then you allow the, so usually it's a band pass filter that is used. If you use a band pass filter, then you can take whether it is the, the sum of the frequencies or the difference of the frequencies, depending on the uh, pass band of the filter that you're using. So this way you have the local oscillator generating this oscillating signal. You have the incoming RF and when they mix, you get what we call the IF or the intermediate frequency. So the circuit that generates this local oscillator signal is called the oscillator. And how does it work? The oscillator usually works by converting uh, a part of DC power uh, that is used, for example, uh, for biasing or something like that. And it will convert that into the periodic signal. Or even the noise that is inherent in the oscillator can be used to generate this uh, uh, output oscillating signal. What it means is that the oscillator doesn't require an input RF signal. From the circuit itself, it can either use its noise or the uh, input DC signal, but part of the DC signal, which is used for bias. It can use part of it to generate the carrier uh, frequency that we're talking about. So another way of saying it is that the oscillator is a circuit that generates RF outputs without an input RF signal. No input RF signal, but there'll be an output RF signal. And that out, output RF signal is, has to be what? A periodic signal, okay? A periodic signal. And it does not require an input to be able to generate that output. 
Now, either a diode or a transistor is what is used as the active device in oscillators. But in these days, we no longer use diodes. In the past, diodes have been very, very popular. And one of the most popular diodes that we use in oscillator design was, who, I mean, we discussed this before. Uh, in the beginning, when we were discussing active devices. It was Verector diode, if you remember that. Verector diode is a diode that's used mostly in uh, oscillator design. But these days, we mostly use transistors instead of uh, uh, diodes because of the advance in the design and fabrication of uh, transistors. So we use these transistors, but then in addition to the transistors, we also need some passive circuits. We need the passive circuits to be able to shape the uh, resonant frequency of the signal that the oscillator is producing. Because the signal produces the, uh, was it, the oscillator produces a signal and it must uh, come with a certain resonant frequency. So this pass passive circuit is usually a resonator. The passive circuit is usually what? A resonator or a resonance circuit, which when you feed back the output of the transistor, it's able to resonate at a particular frequency. And that eventually becomes the uh, frequency of the oscillator signal that is uh, given as the output. We'll look at generally how this comes about a bit later. So as I said before, you either have a transient signal or electrical noise, which initially triggers the uh, oscillation. So if you look at a minute, if you look at the if you look at this uh, uh, diagram here, what you realize is that the, initially, the initial start of oscillation is very little, right? And then it starts to grow and keeps growing until it reaches an equilibrium. And the amplitude stays the same with a particular frequency of oscillation. So this amplitude will be determined by the uh, dynamic range of the active device, right? how far the amplitude can grow will be dependent on the dynamic range of the active device because beyond a certain amplitude, the active device will be driven into what? Saturation. I'm going to unmute the, uh, your mic so that you can have a question. Oh, I'm asking questions. <laughs> What is the Okay. Okay, so we'll continue. So the signal begins to grow like that until it reaches equilibrium. And this is how that is uh, usually achieved. So this is how it, ha it, it actually happens. So you have this circuit here. Uh, this X here is the input. And then you see A here is for the uh, uh, amplification of the amplifier. That's the active device that is used. And then there's the output, which is Y. A portion of the output is sampled again. <laughs> a portion of the output is sampled again. And then this is the resonator. It has a certain feedback factor B, 
And then from the resonator, it comes back to the input again. And then it adds to the original input, which is either your noise or the DC signal. Do you understand that? So that this goes into the active device that is amplified again. So every stage of amplification will increase this initial trigger. Every stage of application, amplification will keep on increasing this initial trigger until it reaches equilibrium. When does it reach equilibrium? When saturation is reached. Because even though you increase the input, the output will no longer increase, if you remember that, okay? Uh, so that is how the oscillation comes about. But then there are conditions that must be fulfilled for the oscillator to actually oscillate and generate that carrier frequency. But let's take note of these terms. So we have the output, which is Y, the input, which is X. So that if a part of the output is taken back into the resonator, which is a feedback system, back into the input, the new input then becomes what? X times A, okay, then plus B. That will be the new input. This new input will then be fed back again into the amplifier. It means it will be multiplied again by A. So what you get is that Y, which is the output here, will be A times X, the original input, plus BY. And BY is the portion of the output that has been fed back into the input again. So this BY is added to X, the original input, and it is amplified again, and then you get the output Y. Uh, from this, you can rearrange this equation to get uh, y divided by x. If you are re rearrange it to get y divided by x, then you get what we call the closed loop gain, which is given by t equals y over x, and to be equal to a divided by 1 minus a beta. Now, what you realize is that if a beta here is equal to 1, the denominator here will be 0. Right? Right? You can no longer hear me. Okay, okay. So if a b here is equal to one, one minus a b then becomes zero, and the denominator will be zero. And then the t will be driven to infinity because this is a divided by zero. But what it actually also means is that you have an output y without a corresponding input x because the output here corresponds to A here and X here corresponds to the denominator here. So when AB equals one and this is zero, it is like there is no input, but there's what? An output. And then that way, the uh, amplifier becomes unstable and it begins to oscillate, generating that signal we saw here, which will grow until it reaches equilibrium. Now, AB here, the product A beta is known as the loop gain. A beta is known as the loop gain, which is a product of the transfer function of the individual units. So that's the amplifier and the resonator. The amplifier is characterized by A and the resonator is characterized by B. And the product is called the loop gain. Another way of looking at it is that A is the forward path gain or simply just the gain of the amplifier. And B is a, is a factor of the resonance circuits, okay? So as I said, when the loop gain is unity, that is when A, B here is equal to one, then T becomes infinite, which means that the circuit has an output Y without a corresponding input X. And then it becomes unstable and it begins to oscillate. So the condition that A, B equals one is known as the Barhausen criterion. What it means is that for the oscillator to begin to oscillate, the product of A and B beta must be equal to one. This condition must always be satisfied. And when it is satisfied, it will then oscillate. And the condition is called Barhausen criterion. Alternatively, if AB was subtracted from X, what that means is that the feedback here, if this was minus, if this plus here were minus, then the new equation would have been what? The denominator would not be one plus A beta instead of one minus A beta. And the new criterion will be A beta equals what? Minus one. When this is the new criterion, we call that criterion the Nyquist criterion. The Nyquist criterion. 
And we're not talking about the Nyquist sampling rate. This is the criterion, the Nyquist criterion. And this is so because the output of the amplifier is always 180 degrees out of phase. And 180 degrees is the same thing as what? Minus one. And therefore, for this to be equal to zero, this has to be equal to what? Minus one. Now, a general, a general oscillator will look like this. So you have the resonance circuit, which is the feedback circuit, is made up of what? Y1, Y2, and Y3. Uh, there are equations that describe the relationship between Y1, Y2, and Y3. Uh, we will not go through that derivation, but we will discuss the, uh, the result of that derivation. T here will be the active, active uh, device, so that will be a transistor. So this transistor may either be a BGT or a FET. And of course, YL is the load, YL is the load. Now what you realize is that, so there's the output of the transistor which goes to the load. And part of that load is sampled again back into this resonant tank made up of what? Y1, Y2, and Y3, that's the resonant tank. I'm talking about uh, this this portion here, that's the resonant tank, made up of Y1, Y2, and Y3. So hey, please, question. Okay. Why is the input? Hmm? I've Why told, is the input to this? I've told that the oscillator... Okay, it requires no input. It doesn't require an input. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true, it's true, it's true. The noise from the transmitter okay. itself may be the initial trigger. So the noise in the transistor is amplified, goes to the output, and is fed back through the resonant tank, and then back into the transistor again. Do you see that? Then there's a second phase of uh, amplification again. The feedback continues like that. And then it keeps growing, as we saw in that uh, uh, waveform. So as it keeps growing, the amplitude keeps increasing until it reaches equilibrium. So I'm saying that the circle here is actually the uh, resonant tank which shapes the resonant frequency of the oscillator. Now, Y1 and Y2 must be of the same uh, device. <laughs> Who is highlighting? <laughs> Y1 and Y2 must be of the same reactants. They are all reactants. So Y1, Y2, and Y2 are reactants, i.e. either a capacitor or inductor. So that if Y1 is an inductor, then Y2 also has to be an inductor. And this is what you would have uh, realized if we, have derived, if we had derived the equations. If Y1 is an inductor, Y2 also has to be an inductor. In that case, then Y3 must definitely then be what? A capacitor. Y3 then must be a capacitor. Again, if Y1 is a capacitor and Y2 is a capacitor, then Y3 must be what? An inductor. And this is a setup of a generalized oscillator. So in the case that Y1 and Y2 are inductors, and then Y3 is a capacitor, we have a kind of uh, oscillator we call what? Hartley oscillator, Hartley oscillator. L1, L2 are inductors, and then the third element is a capacitor. You know that at resonance, the sum of the reactances of all the uh, reactive elements, L1, L2, and L3, and C3 should be equal to zero. So if you add them and equate them to zero, you can find an expression for the resonant frequency, which is omega. So omega squared is given by this, and you can find an expression for F, which will be one over two pi square root of all of this. And that will become the resonant frequency of a Hartley oscillator. Now, you realize that this is an inductor and this is also an inductor. L1 is a self-inductance of L1 and then L2 is a self-inductance of L2, right? But there could be mutual inductance between L1 and L2. This equation doesn't take that into consideration. If you were to take into consideration the mutual inductance between L1 and L2, then we have to introduce a coupling factor K. And that coupling factor K 
It's a correction term and is given by 2k into brackets L1 times L2 raised to the power 0.5. And this will be added to L1 plus L2. So here that you have L1 plus L2, we must add the correction factor 2k into bracket L1 times L2 raised to the power 0.5. If we take the coupling between the two inductors into consideration. Now in this one, this is still what? A Hartley oscillator. You can see L1, L2, and C3 forming the resonant tank, and therefore it is still a Hartley oscillator. What we have added is the biasing circuit, made up of what? An RFC, RB1, and RB2. And if you would remember, since we are supplying DC, which is VCC, to bias the transistor, then we need here what? An RF choke. RF choke such that whatever RF is fed back into the circuit will not pass through the uh, biasing path. Because if this one was not there, it could actually come and then you'll be using the RF to bias the transistor and it will not work well at its present point. So then you need an RF choke such that any RF signal that will come here will see what? An open circuit because the RF signal has a high frequency. Uh, we may go off in about five minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll restart the session again. So the RF choke here means that for the DC, it will see what? A short circuit, right? So the DC can come through, right? But, and the DC will come through, it should not come through this path. It should come through this path and bias the transistor. And then if the DC were to come so the RB1 here, the RB1 and RB2 are the ones that bias the transistor. But it will not be, the RF, the RF signal cannot come and bias the transistor because here is an RF choke. And for the DC, it is short. For the RF, it is open. The same way, we would also don't want the DC signal to come through the input of the transistor. And therefore, they say, what? A capacitor block here. For the capacitor block, sorry. For the capacitor block, the DC will see an open and therefore cannot come to the input of the transistor. So that only the resonant tank, the output in the resonant tank can come back. So output of the transistor going to the resonant tank can come back and feed the input of the uh, uh, transistor and therefore generate the oscillation that we talk about. Now, on the other hand, if C1 and C2 are uh, capacitors then, or Y1 and Y2 are capacitors, then Y3 has to be what? Uh, an inductor. And this arrangement, you have what we call the culpit oscillator. And the treatment of the culpit oscillator is very similar to the treatment of the Hartley oscillator. At resonance, the sum of the reactances equals zero, and then we can find an equation for the resonant frequency in a similar way. And this is also a bias Hartley, uh, sorry, culpit oscillator. Again, you have VCC, the RFC, the capacitor block, and there's another capacitor block here. Why is this capacitor block necessary? Because the output of, of the resonant tank has what? An inductor, L. If you don't have a capacitor block here, then the DC which comes here will find a short circuit path through the inductor and go to the output. And therefore, you need this capacitor block to block whatever DC comes through. Because for the DC, the capacitor block is open, even though the inductor here is short. That is why you have CB2 here, in addition to CD1, which we explained for the case of the Hartley oscillator. Now, the purpose of CB2, as I said, is just to block the DC coming through the output and nothing else. The, resonate, the resonance frequency is still satisfied by C1, C2, and L3 only. But there's a similar oscillator. Here we use a FET transistor, except that C3 here has a different function, or function that is similar to the function of CB2 here, but it is taken into consideration in determining the resonance frequency. In other words, in this case, you choose C1, C2, and L3 to satisfy this equation here. But in the case here, the L3 must be chosen slightly higher 
that is required to satisfy the resonance frequency. And then the reactance of C3 will subtract from the reactance of L3 because the reactance of a capacitor is negative. So how much C3 subtracts from the reactance of L3 would lead to the entire resonance circuit satisfying the equation here. And if that is a choice of L3 and C3, then we have what we call the clap oscillator. Uh, a quick question, and then I will uh, end this session and then start it again because uh, if someone has a question, you can ask. Uh, no question if you have a question No question. You will do it. I'm muted from uh, microphones because it's just noise coming from them. So those ones are being muted. Hey, John. Why not? Why Yes, is there a question? Of course, I'm muting you. Oh my god. Okay, so um I'll start the session again. Uh <clears throat> but let's continue until it ends. So that is the difference between the clap oscillator, the clap oscillator and the uh, culprit oscillator. <clears throat> now sometimes we use a crystal. If you remember in your analog communication class. The uh, FM receiver will usually have a crystal oscillator as a reference frequency. Why do we use a crystal oscillator? Because of two things. In fact, in particular, it has a very stable frequency. The crystal oscillator will provide a very stable frequency, and the frequency change with respect to temperature is very, very insignificant. So the frequency change is on the order of 0 0.01. On the order of 0 0.01, on the order of 0.01% per degree Celsius. You know that if there is a rise in temperature, then uh, because of the effects of temperature, then the circuit, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Just wave if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We're hearing you. Yes, I can. yes, we can. Yeah, we are hearing. Can hear you. Uh -huh. to mute. Can hear you. Okay. So the the crystal oscillator has a very stable frequency, and the frequency changes of the order of zero point zero one percent per degree Celsius rise in temperature, and therefore sometimes it is also used in the design of oscillator to provide that stable frequency, right? And the 
quartz and ceramic crystals are the ones that are usually used in oscillator circuits. And they can either provide, they provide both a, a parallel and a series resonance, as you see in this uh, circuit. So you have a series resonance here and then a parallel resonance with this capacitor CP. So the series resonance gives us a frequency of omega s and the parallel resonance gives us a frequency of what? Omega p. And then there's a frequency range within which this uh, crystal can actually be used as an inductor. That frequency range is the delta omega, which is omega p minus omega s, which can be approximated as cs over 2cp times omega s. And therefore, the uh, delta omega, which is also known as the pulling factor or the pulling figure of the crystal, tells us the range within which the crystal can be used as an inductor. And because omega p is usually just slightly higher than omega s, you see that the difference is very small. So that's for the design of an oscillator, the crystal must be selected such that the frequency of oscillation falls between omega s and omega p. In that case, it will begin to operate as an inductor. Why is that necessary? If you remember, in the case of the culprit oscillator here, you see that this inductor is a problem. We have to find a way of what? Stopping uh, the DC from leaking through the inductor. But this inductor can be replaced by a crystal. And then you don't need to make this adjustment again, which is why sometimes a crystal is used to replace the inductor in the circuits. So if you see here, this is a culprit oscillator. You have C1 and C2. And then the inductor of the resonant tank is replaced by what? A crystal. This uh, one here is a crystal. And the crystal here is now acting what? as an inductor. And together with C1 and C2, they form the resonant tank. And the operation is the same as we have described uh, previously. So as I said before, the crystal provides a very stable frequency of oscillation over a wide range of temperature. Uh, because for every rise in temperature, the frequency almost remains the same. That's why we say over a wide range of temperature. The only disadvantage of the crystal is that once the crystal has been cut and it is shaped, its resonant frequency cannot be varied by any much. It's, it's almost like sets. So the frequency uh, tuning range of the crystal oscillator is very, very small. Unlike those of, if you use inductors and capacitors, you can actually vary the, you can use variable inductors and then by varying the inductor, you can actually change, or varying the capacitor, you can change the tuning range. And in fact, in your radio sets, whether it is your FM radio set, when you are tuning, turning the dial, what you're actually doing is changing the values of capacitors. And as you're changing the values of the capacitors, the resonant frequency is also changing until you get to the resonant frequency or the carrier frequency which you're looking for, whether it is a joy 99.7 or anything like that. So when you are tuning, what you're actually doing is changing uh, the values of the capacitors in a variable capacitor until you reach the resonant frequency which you are selecting as your tuning frequency. But the case of a crystal oscillator is that this tuning range is very small and that's the major drawback. But uh, this can be uh, somehow mitigated by adding a capacitor in parallel with the crystal. So that the capacitor can be varied and then the resonant frequency varied. so that the capacitor of the tuned circuit now can be varied to change the frequency of oscillation, as I said before, okay? Now the changing of the frequency of oscillation, the changing of the frequency of oscillation can also be achieved electronically. If you uh, remember, for a capacitor, what is XC for a capacitor? 
is equal to what? One divided by two pi two pi fc. I think we discussed this when we we're discussing the vector diode. So what you can see is that you can make frequency the subject here and xc will come down. Then as you are changing the capacitance here, you need you'll be changing what the frequency. And if there's a way to change the capacitance electronically, then the frequency can also be changed electronically. Do you understand that? And that is the idea that is used uh, in vector diodes. So in vector diodes, the junction capacitance, which is the uh, PN junction, uh, can be controlled using uh, an applied uh, bias voltage. In other words, if you reverse bias the vector diode, if you increase the biasing, then you are at increasing the, uh, the depletion region. And if you increase the depletion region, you are changing D, which is the distance between the two plates of the parallel capacitor. Uh, and if you are changing D, then you are effectively changing C. And by changing C, you are effectively changing what? F. And that way, using the bias, the frequency can be changed. In other words, the vector diode can be used to generate different frequencies by changing its depletion region, which is also controlled using what? The bias voltage. So there are two types of such vector diode. We have the abrupt junction diode. <clears throat> this one provides a very high Q. When we're discussing resonators, you remember what we said about Q. It provides a very high Q uh, and it has a wide tuning voltage range, which is from zero to 60 volts. That means that you can apply voltages from zero up to 60, which means you can vary the uh, distance of the depletion region significantly, which also means that you can vary the frequency uh, significantly. The hyper abrupt type diodes. This one exhibits a quadratic characteristics of the capacitance with applied voltage. So the applied voltage as it is changing will actually result in very high capacitance. And again, it provides a wide frequency range as a result. So these diodes are preferred for tuning over wide frequency range because the increasing of the frequency with respect to the capacitance is of quadratic nature, that is squared. So you increase the capacitance by two and the frequency can be increased by what? Four, because of the squared nature of it. And therefore it provides a very wide tuning range even though, uh, so you can achieve an octave tuning range within less than what, 20 volts. Whereas in the case of the abrupt junction, even up to 60 volts, you cannot reach that octave. That is eight times of the tuning range. Uh, it's not possible. So octave is like 10 to the power eight of the tuning range, which is like uh, 100 megahertz uh, within just an applied voltage of what, 20 volts. This is not possible with the uh, abrupt junction diode. But the hyper abrupt junction diode uh, has a significant disadvantage. They have a low Q and therefore the phase noise is higher. The phase noise is the figure of merit for, uh, what do you call it, uh, for oscillators. But good oscillators have low phase noise. Any oscillator that has a high phase noise is not a good oscillator because the phase noise actually translates into frequency uh, jitters. And therefore, you will not get a very clean uh, frequency output from the oscillator. So that is the disadvantage of the uh, hyper abrupt type diodes. Uh, Somewhere well quiet. Uh, C, which is a capacitance, is related to the voltages by this equation here. A is a constant, 
And VR is the applied reverse bias voltage of the verified diode. And VB is the built-in potential of the diode. Now you can see that <clears throat> uh, by varying the voltage V, the capacitance can be varied. And by varying the capacitance, also the frequency can be varied. And here is a number between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6, depending on the type of the junction that is being used. The uh, voltage control oscillator usually has a parallel uh, tuning circuit. That is the equivalent circuit. It's one of a parallel circuit. And the frequency of oscillation is given by this. Where CF is the fixed capacitor, and then C is the vector diode, the capacitance of the vector diode. And therefore, omega, which is the frequency of oscillation, is given by uh, So this is the end of the presentation. I will now unmute for uh, questions, and then we can end the session. <laughs> I have a question. That sounds nice. Oh. You can ask. I think you can. Hello. Okay, so you can unmute and ask a question. Mm. Yes. So um the crystal dial the, the crystal oscillator, what's the crystal made of? Like let me see crystal. I mentioned that earlier. I said it's made of well, quartz. Has it conduct? Quartz and ceramics. That's what it's made of. And you can see it, it's like a, a transducer, right? Its vibration is converted to electrical signal. Are you following, Derek? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So crystal is usually a transducer. The vibration of the crystal translates to an electrical signal, and that's why it is being used in a circuit. Thank you. If you want to ask a question and you wave, I can unmute you. You can unmute your listener and you ask the question. Hillary. Okay, then some announcements. Are you with me? I gave you a 10 projects. Uh, the filters. So now you can assume that we are back in school and you start working on it. Today, today's date is first. After here, I will give you information about the V class, the KNST V class. That's where you'll be submitting the assignments, the 10 projects. Uh, I can just tell you that if you go to the KNST V class, you search for TE364, which is communication circuits. And then you can enroll in that class. The password for enrollment is TE364, TE364. No space in between TE and 364, and it's all caps. My room is so dark. TE is all caps, 364, and so you enroll. And therefore, I expect that by the 14th, no, 15th of March, 